Boom, what's up everyone? Welcome to Simulation. I'm your host, Alan Sakian. Very excited to still be at COFES, the Congress on the Future of Engineering Software for our second annual partnership with them. We are now speaking to Joe Walsh. Hello. Hello. Thanks for coming on to the show. Well, thank you very much for having me. This is gonna be a lot of fun, very excited. Joe's background is crazy interesting. He spent nine and a half years, and still is, the CEO and founder of Intrinsim, which is developing next-gen engineering applications, shorter development cycles, and leveraging innovative technologies. He has also spent four years, and still now, is the CEO and co-founder of Assess Initiative, which is bringing together key players in software tools for model-based analysis, simulation, and systems engineering to expand use and benefit of these tools. Joe, before we get into that, which is gonna be super exciting, I wanna ask you about your journey. How did you get to the point where you're at today? Where did the fascination for engineering software come from? Tell us about this journey. Okay, actually my journey is very unorthodox. I started out uh, as an engineer, uh, as studying engineering, architectural engineering in school with a specialty in structural analysis. Then I re was actually acting as a structural engineer for about eight to 10 years, and more and more that developed into understanding how to use finite element analysis, how to use numerical techniques to do the analysis and to do the structural engineering. And then one day I basically woke up from that environment and I was irritated with the company I was working for because I got the, high, the best rating ever and they were gonna give me the same raise as the, as the guy who did terrible. And an opportunity came along to become a, a applications engineer for a systems integrator. So it was an interesting opportunity. I jumped at it partially because of previous frustration, but partially because it was something new and different. It was talking to people. And I was a rare engineer that I was good at talking to people. So I decided to jump on it and then I was going to learn sales and I was going to be in a sales environment doing the technical support. Quickly, the CEO's idea of selling was going out to the golf course and waiting for customers to show up. So I figured out if I needed a job, I better figure out how to do sales. So I picked up a book uh, by Zig Ziglar and taught myself how to do sales. Um, then shortly left that company and started my own consulting company, working on very complex engineering problems that people were having trouble solving. Um, and in, then I was actually invited to head up for uh, a UK-based company, the North American entry of their finite element products. Um, and then a year afterwards, the CEO called me in and said, I'm going back to the UK, why don't you take over as CEO? So I got to be a CEO of a $2 million a year software company at the age of 30. Wow. So it was very interesting, very dynamic, and two weeks later I was sued by our shareholders. Uh, we re immediately had a major cash flow problem, had to let go eight people, so it was a whole experience in baptism by fire. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, and um, spent three years doing that, turned the company around, got it working well, and then moved on to another UK-based company and set up operations there and brought their product to the North American market. So it was a matter of understanding the technology, the application, and having to learn marketing, sales, accounting, financials, all in order to make it work because I couldn't hire, have, afford an accountant anymore. So I had to learn all these principles, all these concepts. Went back to my own consulting company where I decided I was going to do go back to being an engineer, and then I said, so I, I went to all the major companies and said, give me your near impossible problems that the big guys can't solve. And that, I, love it. I almost starved to death for three years. <laughs> yeah. And then it turned out that um, Goodyear and NASA called me on some problems and said, we've got some that they won't solve. Goodyear had a great one. He said, we've been working on it for 18 months. We're willing to give you a try. Bad news is you get six weeks. We've had an army of 10 people working on it for 18 months and we haven't been able to do anything. You got six weeks. And so um, we went ahead and did the project. Um, it took seven weeks. And at the end of the project, they called me into their finance department and said, you can't leave without signing a retainer for the next three years. And we don't know what you're going to work on, but you're going to work on these things. Yeah, yeah. So that then led to working on interesting projects for very different country companies. But the company's technology he was based on decided to sell itself. Self, I could see the writing on the wall. And so I applied to, be, to work for a friend of mine who I knew ran an ad in a paper for someone to run Southeast sales for component software, for ACES Solid Modeling. So I called, so I called him up and said, you want to save a headhunter's fee? He, yield, he called me immediately with a, he had the plane ticket in my hands and told me I was hired when I got there. So I took over sales for spatial, 
to, and it was the first time I've ever done just sales. So it's been part of what I did. So yeah, I learned, sure. okay, how, and my wife yelled at me, why are you trying to do sales? You're an engineer. Mm -hmm. And I said, I want to find out what I can do. So we actually led and, and built the best sales track for the next three years. Um, and then uh, went on to head up the, became worldwide, VP of worldwide sales for IronCAD, and then VP of business development for eight years for Symmetrics doing automatic mesh generation technology. And then founded, um, Intrinsim, the key thing on the, the component software technology from spatial and from symmetrics, what it taught me was we had to deal with hundreds and hundreds of different business models. Every customer in the component software model had a different business model. Yeah. So therefore, it was learning how to adapt to business models, yes. and that really taught me an understanding about where technology and business lie and how they cross into each other yeah. and how business people rarely understand technology and technology people rarely understand business. So that was the, the reason for founding Intrinsim in the first place. And although, as you mentioned, we do engineering applications and things, Intrinsim owns zero IP. Mm. Zero intellectual property. We do have a technology broker model where we actually broker technology mm. to other software vendors. And we manage the licensing, but it's like a real estate broker. We don't own the house. We don't own the IP. Yeah. We do it all with other people's intellectual property. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, and that then led to, okay, we met enough people and we saw things happening that the Assess Initiative made sense to try to see. We saw some opportunities where there, the entire, having coming from the simulation space, we s saw that the, although growth was occurring, there was a huge opportunity because engineering simulation can actually drive hu the major business objectives and it wasn't being utilized, but people were beginning to realize it. And we realized that engineering simulation isn't it's only growing eight, nine percent a year, which is four times as fast as any other engineering software. But we felt felt they could grow significantly. I'm being yeah. facetious by only eight to nine percent a year. Yeah. This is for over 30 years. And so the the idea was that we could really build that there really was an opportunity for an inflection point for dramatic growth of yes. that entire industry. And so I decided to that it was too big for any single player, too big for the big software vendors, too big for the end users. So I created the Assess Initiative as a consortium to bring together the people to enable that significant growth. Yeah, this is such a cool story. So going back to when you're finding yourself at like using and getting used to uh, from an art from an architectural uh, perspective, getting involved in the engineering process, and then seeing sort of that you are, can also pick up uh, as an engineer business skills and sales skills. And then you had multiple sort of uh, examples of times that you meshed the technology and the business side of things together and were able to, that's a very, very important skill, super important. And there's, there's a lot of, of, of talk in, you know, in Silicon Valley and other places in the world where you see that you know, maybe coders and salespeople just are you know, kind of on different wavelengths and stuff like that. But I think it's very important to be able to find that, that, that overlap and how to make sales relatable to technologists, how to make technology re even more relatable to sales and business. So that's a thing that you mentioned I think is extremely important to, to embody and that really adds that multidisciplinary perspective of when you know how to you know build rapport with humans as well as know how to program a computer. These are very interesting things to, to know how to do both of. And then actually with you know, go, going all the way up to, to Intrinsim, even before that, you obviously have had a tremendous amount of experience. It doesn't, I don't even know, what is this, like 35 years, something? 40. 40 years of experience. Yeah, so that's when, that's when you really know that you've, you know, you're not even at, you know, you're at like 2x or 3x mastery level in, in a field. And that's, that's really important. And then to continue this 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 uh, very humble prince, this humble first principle. As you continue going, is just going to you know ramp things up even further down the line. But at Intrinsim, which you just mentioned there, let's start with this, where you said that your and I want to back up prior to Intrinsim, which you you were explaining how you know you don't own any IP, but the it almost acts like a platform that that people bring on their services too and then you license out those services but maybe before even before that which i'm sure you're going to correct me and everything but before that teach us about you know give us give us a little bit more on those like 20 years of time especially those last 
you said there were two periods where you were a VP as well at two like multi-year right. yes. organizations. What was going on there? Uh, it was a little bit. Um, it was a very eclectic background. It was a very opportunity driven. And it was very much um, listening to the passion and the challenge and learning to grow. And it was constantly about, oh, there's a whole new role. Let's, let's figure out how to apply engineering analytical principles to the new role. So uh, applying the approach you would do to a very complex engineering analysis problem actually turned out to make accounting very straightforward and easy. Applying that to sales actually turned out to be very, very effective. And you think of sales instead as a highly nonlinear problem, but with the nonlinearity is the people's personalities. So it's totally unpredictable. So it becomes there is actually a class of engineering problems that you solve that are that sort of thing. So applying those same principles to psychology, applying engineering principles to psychology, to the sales processes, to things was actually very challenging yeah. and very interesting. And it was very, um, as I said, opportunity driven, very eclectic, and constantly. A learning experience and so it, it, it was all driven by the, the desire to keep learning and, and so everything was a new experience including legal things some of the things you learn aren't wonderful <laughs> but it, you, you learn and, and every experience teaches and, and that whole process there wasn't a here's my five-year goal here's my ten-year goal it was I'm gonna get through today and and learn something from it and tomorrow we're gonna grow from that and in following the vectors at the point in time that made the most sense most sense when 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 you speak about taking engineering principles and bringing them into psychology, that is such an interesting field that we've you know we've talked about on the show quite a bit. Is how can you potentially even map out human experience mm -hmm. in a in a in an engineering mindset type of way? Can you what are computational properties of consciousness? These types of of thought processes. So okay, so now let's now take us to you know all. You know this 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 last thing that you're mentioning about engineering simulation and the importance of that. I'm very excited to talk about that. But as you as you find yourself doing intrinsim and you're learning on both the you know business as well as the techno technology side of things, you were mentioning there's different these different really cool use cases across businesses that you're kind of working and building rapport with them, seeing what they need, giving them the right tools mm -hmm. and solutions to teach us about what that's been like. Okay, well, Intrinsim was an experiment, or still is an experiment, and the experiment is on the idea that this eclectic background that I had that actually took me into the different areas, so it took me into the marketing, into the sales, into the business, into the finance, into the legal, as well as staying in the technical. Um, and it also, so my experience also then had me connected up with all the technical people talking about all these issues all the time. So at Intrinsim, I came to the realization that there was a break in general between business and technology. People would have great business models needed technology. Mm. They needed to feed the beast. Mm -hmm. People had great technology, couldn't figure out how to take it to market. Mm -hmm. So I created Intrinsim under the principle of connecting worldwide business and technology. Yeah. And the idea is it would be limited only to the engineering software space. We wouldn't sell to anybody else, only sell to engineering software vendors. But what we would do is we would provide two different sorts of aspects. We would go find some interesting leading edge technologies that they could license as components that they could embed inside their software. Okay, this would be like a, an add-on to CAD. No, like it that. would be like um, the rendering engine in Ed in CAD. It a would be like the solid modeling engine in the CAD. Okay. It would be like the finite element mesh generation in the CAD. It would be so the, the end user would never see it. He'd never even see it as an add-on. It's core functionality, but it wasn't developed by the software vendor. Okay, so so, so the AutoCAD Intel inside would of software. buy the yeah. and embedded in in, in yeah. AutoCAD. Yes. Interesting. So that and the then your fr and your friends that started that company that went through you would get paid and you would get a percentage of that. Exactly. Uh, interesting. Okay. So, so the, what we did is we set it up and said, okay, we know technology people need to go to market. We know people who need technology, so we'll start there. And we made that connection. So we we acted as a broker, acting between the connecting the right people together. Yeah, yeah. And then we said, okay, now that we have this part of the business going, now we're going to turn around and say, well, actually, there's several other people who just need good business consulting, good marketing consulting, good positioning, um, um, good messaging. How do they actually explain their market? How do they take their product to market? And so we started that thinking primarily focusing on smaller and medium-sized businesses. The larger software vendors found out about it and they didn't want us to develop their strategies, they wanted us to vet their strategies. 
So we work with companies from like Autodesk, we work with companies like Siemens, uh, and we work all the way down to the two million people in the garage. We don't, there's no difference. We'll work on projects as big as everything it takes to go to market, or as small as we need help with this presentation. Is we fill whatever the gap is, including building websites, whatever it takes. And so we build a very, we have a very virtual company and we build in, we have resources we can bring in to build in whatever needs to be filled. Very small um, team that is core and then we build out as we need to for every project. All the way to, we're actually working with another company so we can go all the way to sales. And so it's all about what are the gaps? How do we fill those in? How do we make the people more successful? Interesting. Um, all in engineering software. Though. All in engineering software only. So the idea was, there, we, cu we couldn't have a broad space and a broad offering. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So we either needed to have a broad space in a, in a, in a very yeah, yeah. Narrow small, offering. narrow yeah, offering, yeah, yeah. or we needed to have a narrow space and a broad offering. Yeah, yeah. So we went with the narrow space and a broad offering. Very cool, very cool. So then you ended up becoming uh, the a one-stop shop for engineering software. That's right. Then that's kind of what, now. And we've also, because yeah. we do this with so many people thing, we're also the one-stop shop for, well, we don't know exactly what we need. We want to talk to someone about manufacturing simulation. Yeah, yeah. So we're the connector. The connector too, yeah, yeah. Well, okay, well, now, this is so cool. I'm, 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 ex I'm, I'm, I'm running all of these ideas of what this looks like. You gave us an idea of what one of the one of the uh, a ways that like a, a, a CAD software company would want to license through you one of the cool um, the additions that they'd embed into some of the algorithms they'd embed into their CAD software, and then the user wouldn't even know. Wouldn't even know. And then, then the that's one example. Give us other interesting examples like that from Intrinsim. Okay, so the, the, the one example is, is that we have a portfolio of about eight different technologies where we use what we call a technology broker model, where we do the licensing, where it's all embedded inside, no one sees it, no one yes. knows anything about it. And was that the majority, would you say, of, the, of Intrinsim is doing stuff like that? It's actually about half and half, half right now. It's a little bit more than half. That's sl the slight majority is still doing that technology licensing. The other half is go-to-market consulting, yes. um, okay. where people, we will sit with them and have a brainstorm session about where are you, what are you trying to accomplish? Where are you going? What's it take to get there? And how can we help you get there? Mm -hmm. So this may include things like um, we work with SIR on generative design on trying to refine their message and how they can better position against the competition and how to, to create a unique position that they can leverage for go-to-market and awareness. We well, loved hosting them on the show. Yeah. They're incredible. They are incredible. Yes. And, and we like working with them to help out their technology. We, but we work with probably, we. We've worked with over 60 companies on that aspect already so far. Interesting. And so we work with any, and we also, and we work with, with companies, for instance, to do complete awareness campaigns, social media campaigns, press releases, um, collateral, and, and basically whatever it takes to fill that position. So on one side, we're working with the, the whole idea of saying, okay, I've got good technology, I need to take it to market. And the other side, I've got market, I, want, I, need, tech, I need more technology to fill yes, it in. Yes. And the third interesting twist is we're also working with um, larger companies now on basically being the voice of reason, where they will bring in all their people and explain the strategy and why it's so wonderful and we'll tell them, this is great, this is great, here you're drinking Kool-Aid, that's nonsense. Yeah, yeah. And because we've been doing this, because we know everybody, we can get away with that. Oh yeah. And there's actually value to our sure, sure. calling them on their stuff. So, so the last part would be if they do have their technology and their business kind of properly what? structured, then you would come in and say that this part's great, this part is needs help, etc. Okay, now with give us a give us a because <clears throat> if the other fifty percent almost is on helping uh, engineering software with their business strategies. Give us an example of what that looks like. Because you said the scale is anywhere from the full go to market all the way to the deck. Right. So, yeah. What we've been seeing happening more and more often now is, is people basically have really good technology. They don't understand the target markets. They don't understand who's going to buy it. They don't understand how to message to those people. Messaging and positioning are really key. Mm -hmm. They don't understand who the competition is or, mm -hmm. or what the positioning is against the competition. So we help clarify all that sort of information. We help them. It, it could be, we could stop there, 
or but more and more often it's becoming we then help them make the collateral whether it's the PowerPoint presentation data sheets whatever is appropriate videos whatever is appropriate to convey that messaging and we become very thematic and consistent about that messaging and we te teach them that idea of repeat 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 for marketing and let, you know for marketing 101 really repeat that again and so that we really get that home to the engineers where we're successful with that is we can actually under when they talk to us about their technology about why they love it we actually have the technology yeah, background that we can great. understand their technology so they trust us yes. when we talk about exactly. what to do with marketing that's right that's right and so you we guys geek we, out to build rapport <laughs> <laughs> exactly <laughs> so so we built that bridge between the technology and classical marketing and it's not we're not doing anything on marketing that any good marketing firm would do it's just we get the guys over here to believe us and they can communicate and we Correct. can communicate to them and so all of a sudden we know how to market their technical features yes. where it might, they might spend six months trying to figure out how to explain that to a classical marketing team. Yes. We'll get it in an hour. Yeah, that's great. Correct. Correct. Give us, give us an example of how a, a, tech, a really strong uh, like, uh, uh, engineering software company is, <coughs> is maybe struggling with the business side of things, and then how you come in uh, and and have you know you, like you said the, the geek out the friendly build rapport, and then you can really just you know synthesize into making really concise and powerful um, go to market statements and and uh, th right. to get the right clients. Yeah. So we've got two active cases we're working on right now. One is Sire, where we're doing exactly that. Another is a is a company called PSRE, which is about piping research, and they do piping simulation software. Cool. And they do an exceptional job on that, and we've been working with them about right from the beginning and how to grow markets there, uh, and how to message it and how to position it. We actually went all the way back and, and told them, no, your product structure is wrong. We need a whole new product structure because this product structure makes sense to your engineers, but not to any buyer. So that we go all the way back to defining what should the product structure look like, yeah. what what should the pricing look like, what should the structure look like, how do we going to sell this in different parts of the world, been building channel uh, agreements for resellers, the whole nine yards, and then yeah. basically going ahead and helping the messaging. And right now they're currently very successful in building an international uh, distribution channel. Whoa, yeah, the, everything from the from how do you do reseller agreements and international sales all the way to how is the product structured for, for people to purchase. Give, how, how does most engineering software get purchased? Through enterprise clients? Yeah. Um, it, it's a mixture of things. It, it, it depends on the software. The engineering software can be, uh, your, your buyers can be anywhere from a few uh, consulting company to a large enterprise company, uh, to depending on the industry, AEC is a bunch of, you're selling to architects and engineers, so yeah, there's a, that's right. a bunch of small contractors. Okay. So you'll get subcontractors, you, you basically have a supply chain of major OEMs in the automotive and aerospace industry yes, yes. With, with multiple tiers of, of suppliers. So you sell to different levels of the supplier chain. When you get to industries where engineering software isn't as mature, it's more of you're selling to whoever's a, who's wha ever willing to listen. Um, so that like, um, if we're looking at manufacturing, it's, you're looking at the major manufacturing people, usually it's people who can invest in it. it they fall into two categories. They either have enough resources to invest or they're really trying, they're small and they're really trying to be innovative and create a niche by their, being, by their innovations so therefore they leverage the engineering software tools. Mm -hmm. Oh my goodness, okay so, so you're walk, you're walk, you're giving us these great examples of of both a, with of engineering software being very technically advanced but needing assistance on the business side or being interestingly enough potentially business savvy but not having the right technical back. What does that one look like? So in, in that case, for instance, um, we license several different technologies to companies where they turn around and say, "Okay, we're we're." We have a great analysis software, but it really can't read in data from CATIA or from SolidWorks really well. Mm -hmm. So we'll provide them the technology to read the, from DataKit or SolidWorks. Or they may turn around and say, oh, we've got a really good uh, algorithm for solving, but we don't have a mesh generation tool. So we'll provide them the mesh generation tool. Okay. Um, and so we provide a variety of different um, tools that can fit inside, and it's a matter of they they find a technology gap and they then go to the point where saying it's not a core technology it's not what really makes them difference but it is a key technology that they need to have and so that becomes the market where we can help them fill those key needs 
where they don't do development, instead license and integrate. Yeah, yeah, license and integrate. And in and, and this way, they can fill their needs with what they may not have known technically exists on an engineering software side because you act as a liaison that That's understands correct. what they need. That seems to be a reoccurring theme with what you know what you kind of worked your way into on the business and tech side is being able to be that that one stop shop, which is so cool. So okay, what what with Intrinsim plus now assess initiative, which you can explain here in a moment, what has been the the overall con the connecting points because it kind of makes sense that everything that you've been learning with Intrinsim now you're you're basically trying to take the best key players from the deep for the engineering software process and put it into the initiative that is that, that's initiative. actually correct so that my background as I said started out in, in structural analysis and those sort of things and I've always been although we, we broadened out in Intrinsim to do all the engineering simulation and the other jobs where I was running sales and business development, it was any engineering software, the, the symmetrics was simulation still, it was mesh generation. So that, my, my passion and my heart and my experience and background really is still engineering simulation. I work with everybody in the engineering s software space, but engineering simulation is, is the sweet spot. It's also an area where we have extra unique capabilities. Very few people who understand that technology and application at all can even talk marketing, never mind understand it. <laughs> uh, and so that, that that, that was a unique situation and I sat, that actually I was invited to give a presentation at a conference by a friend of mine and I asked him what he wanted me to give the presentation on and he said whatever you want. So I gave it on that the, the role of simulation was changing, the engineering simulation was changing and it was really changing because it's becoming about business drivers not about technology drivers. Up until that time all like advanced cloud? No, no, not cloud. No, okay. it, it's the idea. Uh, for engineering simulation, up until that time, it was things like the cloud. It was things like generative design. It was things like automated mesh generation. All these things were driving broader use. Okay. Now, all of a sudden, there was a change. And that change was because now there, in the 2008-2009 time frame when we had the downturn in the economy, everyone wanted to know how to be more competitive, they want to understand how to be more creative, how to be more innovative, how to reduce cost, how to reduce risk. Yeah, yeah. And very quickly, people said the way you do that is understand your product and, and process performance better. And how do you do that? Engineering simulation. So it became two steps away from all of the major strategic initiatives of every company in the world. And the executives are beginning to realize that. So I made a, the presentation, is about, it's about business drivers, and that's going to change the dynamic of how we do engineering simulation, and that we have an opportunity in this realization to actually change the world. And in, in, of the sim, the, at least the simulation world, which does then, because of what simulation does, it will yeah. change the world. And I gave that presentation, I did that, and the result was the person running the session says we need a whole Congress on that. Wow. I agreed, I grabbed Brad Holtz, yeah. and we decided to put it together. <laughs> yeah. We made it happen. And, and then ever since then, the Assess Initiative has taken on its own life, and it really is now a very passionate thing by hundreds of people saying, okay, how do we really make engineering simulation contribute um, more benefit to the users, more benefit to the use, but also mo really change the dynamic and the paradigm of how we do engineering and how yes. we do design so that we become function-driven design yes, and performance-driven yes, yes. design yes. rather than shape-driven design. Okay. All right. Here's here's this here's this key. So now now tell me if, if I'm if I if if I'm getting this right. So when you when you when you start off with a a um, that 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 there's this you know we had things like cloud and we had these other we were trying to maybe uh, we were trying to maybe push algorithms in to all these different types th types of processes when maybe what we needed to do was actually look back and refine the algorithms to make them more engineering simulation capable so that then the, when they get broadly applied to the world that they are more effective so that when when you're like you were just describing that there's this there's this 
a, a, a desire for a, a, a really powerful simulations to be able to find the best fit for an, an a, a, for a function uh, in the engineering design, and then when you find that, that can then go and live really robustly in industry. But what the challenge is, is it wasn't about the algorithms. The algorithms have been developing for years quite nicely. But that it was a matter of pushing the algorithms. The, the challenge is that there was a pull to do more. Or as I describe it to people, the pull was so, it, or is, it's in the process of coming because executives are becoming aware of it. So the challenge I put to the analysts is to say, okay, don't tell me how you're going to do 10 times more analysis in the next three years, tell me how you're going to do 10,000 times more because that's what the demand's going to, that's what people are going to be asking for. Yeah, yeah. Our own success says, wait a minute, why don't we do this everywhere? But the challenge of doing it everywhere isn't about the algorithms. Well, the algorithms are about 95% complete. Nothing's ever 100% complete. The challenge is that the level of expertise required to use the algorithms well is way too high to do good CFD analysis of an automotive vehicle and understand the drag, you're typically talking a PhD plus five years experience before he's allowed to actually set up and run any designs that would actually, inf any simulations that would actually truly influence designs. We can't build that type of person fast enough. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And that's the realization is that the, we, that the level of expertise required to run this super advanced technology yeah. is so high we can't possibly ever have enough. So now we have to go a next stage and not dumb down the technology because we tried that 20 years ago. We have to actually make the technology smarter so that the level of expertise that's required is lower. Interesting, yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm following now, which is why companies like SciArt are aiming to make generative design accessible to collegiate Level yes, students. exactly. At the early stage design, where so they can understand design concepts, and in a way that they don't really, they need to understand the engineering problem, but not the details of how the engineering simulation works. Yeah, yeah. Well, in today's classical engineering analysis world, you can't do any real analysis on anything other than the basic toy problem unless you really understand not only the physics, the problem, but you need to know the numerics about how everything works. And so it's, it, the level, required level of expertise is too high to really democratize. And so we have That's to it. actually, we have to find a way to embed intelligence, to, re, to make software smarter, to make it so that more people can use the tools that have less expertise. They're still good engineers, they're just not specialized analysts. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And so we need to move yeah. this to a broader audience to in, make influence more decisions. Interesting. So, but the idea being so cool. So, <laughs> so, so one of the questions we ask is, is people say, well, why do you want to do that? And you say, no, no, no. Why, why isn't it been stronger first? Because why do you want to make dumb design decisions? Yeah, this yeah, is yeah. about making informed design decisions with the physics performance understood with each design decision. Yeah, yeah. It takes some odd thirty-five years to mold the human that can do what potentially what. Um, a, a democratized engineering simulation software can can do exactly, and then this is so cool because then you can the the, the high demand of the exponential technology hockey stick of all of the different robotics and automations that are happening globally is able to actually be fulfilled by bringing down the level of expertise that is required in order for engineers even in at the collegiate level to be able to uh, to to run these engineering simulations at the same time i'm curious to hear your thoughts um it is it is it's it's giving it's democratizing engineering simulation capabilities and we're able to explore more uh, uh funk funk ideal functional fits in different um, areas, which is extremely important. At the same time, isn't then the, um, like a, an, an org the, 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 the organizations that create the optimal engineering softwares, isn't it then just kind of just maybe 20, 30, 100, however many people are, are building this, 
it's more of like a black box technology. Are they then o the only ones that really then kind of understand it? Then? No, basically what happens is it's impossible to capture for all the general applications, it's impossible to capture all the variances and nuances that have to go through. So it's more about they're building tools where the expert users of today can embed their knowledge for their team. So there's very specific company knowledge, there's very specific industry knowledge. So this, isn't, this cannot be done by a software vendor just building out saying, oh, we just do all these decisions for you. No, it has to be instead building a whole platform and a whole approach that enables the people to embed their own knowledge in their own understanding of how they make decisions. Okay, okay. And, and okay. So that it then becomes the expert's role is to create this platform of knowledge rather than running day-to-day -day analysis. Yeah, yeah. Okay, okay. So then, who, so then the users of the engineering simulation are able to... Uh, embed their own examples of use cases that they need and yes. they're leveraging this because then they they, they don't necessarily um, need to know a lot of the is it like partial differential equations it's exactly like what that. it is is partial differential equations and so that they don't so what they're looking at is if you can take the experts of today to leverage that knowledge and embed it in a environment where that knowledge isn't required and it's instead leveraged then they can allow people with less expertise to run things. The challenges come in that we need to still make sure that the analysis is accurate enough. We need to make sure it's credible enough. We, we, we don't, you know, garbage in, garbage out. How do we avoid the, the garbage in, garbage out problem? How do we make sure that it all still works correctly? How does it support the digital twin initiatives? How does it actually go all the way from systems engineering all the way down to detailed engineering? So we're actually trying to do, not trying to take the, what we've been doing in the past, and embed that knowledge and make it usable. We're trying to actually do what we want to do in the future in a two totally new, different way. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The this is so cool. The the democratization is is now it almost it almost changes the the way that we can teach new children that are being birthed into the world about how they can get involved in engineering. That Absolutely. they don't necessarily need to know by hand all of the in, in repetitive mathematics. That's correct. And then that makes it as long as they know the basic of the mathematic. What we should be, in, in my opinion, what we should be teaching in engineering is not the mechanics to sit there and, and re-derive the equations over and over again. It's Und the creative It's side. understand the principles. Yeah, yeah of the equations, yes, understand yes, the yes. concepts of the physics. You need to understand physics really well to do engineering. You need to understand yes. math reason, reasonably well, but you want to, but it's concept driven. And yeah, it's the yeah. concepts and That's then right. the application. Right. So you can determine the application of those concepts. You don't want to be adding, redefining and how two plus two equals four over and over again. So we, we need to get out of the building blocks in engineering are much higher than that. We still don't want to be, deriving partial differential equations over and over again. It's been done once, you understand the concept. Now, how do you describe the physics problem? How do you describe what you're really trying to accomplish once you understand the concepts? Okay. We've gotten caught into a stage where people believe that in order to understand the concepts, you needed to be able to derive everything. Uh-huh, uh-huh, yeah, yeah. That, okay. is, in my opinion, is false. It's all about understanding the concepts of physics, the concepts of engineering, and then applying the creative side, as you mentioned, to the design. Interesting. Interesting. So let, let's see if we can then maybe make it as, as a visual, is there's, there are principles of math and physics to make engineers, and then those con conceptual understandings of engineering from there is all about applying that creatively to problem solving. To problem solving. Interesting. Okay, cool, cool. So then a lot of maybe like Khan Academy and these democratized educational tools for engineering should really need to be focused on the, the principles. Um, right, and, and, and then yeah. leveraging tools like we're talking about that have embedded yes. intelligence yes. to yes. actually yes. show the, the instantiation of those principles. Yeah, yeah, interesting. Okay, that would be so cool to, I wonder, I wonder if there are actual, is, is there an actual then point like child, great, they're already doing so much self-learning nowadays. So is, are, is there a really kind of like a super highway to w of what we Well, the discussed? STEM initiative is trying to work toward that super highway. And actually, um, 
the, the, the right initiative isn't the STEM initiative, it's the STEAM initiative. Correct, with, with, with art, art, yes, in the, As well for the creative, creative portion, because yes. without the creativity, you're not doing engineering, you're just doing math and physics. Yep. Um, so that you need to have the art in there for the creativity. Steam, yeah. Y so yep. it's all the steam, which is gonna power things, which is a good analogy, but it, it, <laughs> it is all about that. So that's there, um, but I think we're still struggling on the, how do we get the people who have graduated with a bachelor's degree in engineering, how do we get them to do really productive work on leveraging the capabilities of engineering simulation tools today because normally that person doesn't even learn about engineering simulation tools until they're getting a PhD. So it, it's, it, we're even working at that higher level on, on the, the expertise gap. Now, the STEAM initiative is helping. We don't have the tools ready to actually play, put simulation into that yet. We want to, but we're, we're, long, we're still trying to get it down to the bachelor's level degree. And we're gonna keep working it. It has to be worked further and further down. Yeah, yeah. Oh wow, it would be so cool to see young, young kids under 10 years old applying assess initiative. Well, the robotics, yeah. and the first robotics is one of the areas where they do we that. We love and, that so And much. they do a lot with actually physics-based simulators, but they're, they're quasi-physics and games, but it's the beginning. Mm -hmm. So that someone can actually say, well, if I did this, how would it behave? Yeah, yeah. And they're developing that understanding. And so that is starting to happen. There's a lot of room for growth there. It's just beginning. All that whole STEAM initiative is actually very embryonic. The, yeah, the first correct. robotic stuff is very young. It's, still it's all, but, but it is, 30, it, both of those are great so. directions. Yeah. They're both great things to go in. And um, yeah. the, the earlier we can get people thinking about problem solving and understanding principles of how things work, the better. Yeah, correct. And, correct. and I think getting it down younger and younger is really, and getting it actually better understood by every age is really about, let's get out of the details, let's not learn by road anymore. Let's uh -huh. not learn how to do math, let's not learn how to do addition by doing 50 addition problems. Let's learn how to do addition by talking over the concept of how addition works yes. repeatedly until the concept's understood, then we only need to do three problems because either we got it or we didn't. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, the giving real world examples that drive con uh, understanding of concepts. And then, and then I love how you point to things like first robotics. We love them. We've m mentored there for a, a, a while, uh, volunteered there for a while and uh, interviewed there multiple times, um, their leadership and, and there's nothing more profound at times. Like this is just when you see 13 to 17 year old teams of just girls that win the highest level awards at the competition. And you're, and then I think to myself, they can teach me so much that I don't know about engineering. <laughs> I'm like, that is awesome. And the other thing is it, about that activity is look at the passion in their events. Look at the passion in the kids. It's just amazing. When they're given this opportunity to learn, they just are all in. Yeah, yeah. They really, and it really gives them a whole new look on life, and they get an understanding of problem solving, which now all of a sudden, engineering isn't scary anymore. Engineering isn't geeky. Engineering's interesting. Yes, correct. Yeah, yeah. So, is Assess Initiative then democratizing engineering simulations? The Assess Initiative is its vision is to significantly increase the use and benefit of engineering simulation. Yeah. Okay. Democratization is actually one of we found out in order to do that vision. That's actually a key pillar, yeah. but it's actually one of seven key pillars. What are the other six? The the we have to do align the government in commercial and research efforts because they're thoroughly misaligned right now. And um, can you ex explain us how? Well, basically what happens is, is the, the um, academic community in research for new technologies is disconnected from the commercial world. Mm. And so they're developing, in some cases they're developing, they're, they're building absolute magic. In some cases they're building things that were already been deployed 20 years ago. Mm. And in other cases they're building things that is of no interest to anybody. Mm. And there's no discussion in connection. I shouldn't say no, there's very little discussion in connection to the commercial world. Uh, the government has got a whole different set of nomenclature, terminology, everything for the same tools. And they're also rebuilding things that are also commercially available. Mm. 
at much higher prices, and this is done mm. all the time. With and taxpayer with money. With taxpayer dollars. And uh, the grants could be going to much different... They could be going to advancing yeah. the technology rather than rebuilding the same technology that's been around for 20 years. And this is a frequently oh. recurring issue in government spending? They will say no. The answer is yes. Now there's certain groups, like for instance, we work with Sandia National Labs. They do some amazing things on physics development. They actually work with us on licensing some technologies. They don't reinvent, so there's certain groups that are actually leveraging very well. But in general, it's very common that they're doing something that's duplicate. The big problem is each, or each major vector doesn't even recognize that the other vector exists and they don't talk to them. So they're all mm. acting in isolation. So yes, exactly. one of the themes is we can't have that inefficiency anymore, so we have to br try to bring those together. And teach us about the, uh, of course, the other three it is, but what, what, what is the, um, the thing that brings those first three together? That's what we're wrestling with. We have to, we're, we're wrestling with why would they want to come together. We know that the current process of the being independent is inefficient, and yeah. we're wasting time, effort, and money um, on, in every single vector. So could one extreme of that potentially be how China has things yes. set up? Okay. That is one extreme. That's not the extreme we're trying to recommend, but yeah. that is one extreme yeah. where it is actually all one thing. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. that's exactly right. Yeah. So they don't have that communication problem. However, there's different associated there's problems, problems associated yeah, with yeah, that. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, okay, and um, that's w that's one extreme, and then I, I want to know what the ideal is. And you said you're wrestling with that, and it it does. See, there's a lot of perverse incentives as well in in the in the science uh, foundation of science, and I think those are we've done shows on that too that we are really working on on uh, creating an incentive system that that is that is completely. Uh, redesigned in very fascinating ways, and you know, like we were, like you were saying, that a, a, a huge principle of that is the, the democratization to get more people involved. Um, but okay, teach us about the. Uh, where, did you have a? Do you have somewhat of, of anything that you can share about? Th there's the several. Solution? There are examples of what, what we call good examples of collaboration. Good examples of alignment. Um, Goodyear's done some amazing work with Sandia National Labs. So has okay. Procter and Gamble done some some good work with Sandia National Labs as well as with Lawrence Livermore National Labs. So there are spot cases which are exceptionally good, and we're actually trying to build a compendium of these cases to put up as assess and say here's what good alignment should look like. Good. So we're in the process of building that compendium of use cases of Great. good alignment right Great. now. And then it's almost as though you could take potentially some of the best processes from that exactly. those use cases and then maybe make that as a, that, that's as a principle set. But we have figured yeah. out that, the, that the, um, the one key common characteristic to all of them is a champion on each side. Yeah, that's that, cool. That really wants to make the alignment work. Yeah, that's cool. Um, that and makes sense. So yeah. it isn't one side can't drive it. It's got to be a champion from both, both sides, sides. Yeah, yeah. that actually makes that work. Yeah, that's, that's very profound, and that makes a lot of sense. Yeah. The one champion on both sides from a, from a, like a, from a, on a research perspective to an industry mm -hmm. per side. Interesting. Interesting. So moving on from the, the aligned other, theme, yeah, yeah, yeah. the next theme is business challenges. And one of the key business challenges is how how do we get the engineers to understand the business language? Yeah, yeah. How do we get them to speak to the executives in terms of business benefits? Yeah. But also from the same standpoint, it's kind of like, okay, what is an understanding of the real value proposition? Yeah. And what are the business issues that are gonna be caused by actually trying to use broader? How, what are the real advantages? How, what does that enable? And one of the key things that comes up is there's gonna be cultural changes. It's not just a technology change. So, so we're working on, on that particular aspect there. The third one is about credibility. And that's all about, hold it, how do we actually understand whether or not the analysis that's been done is good enough for the decision it's trying to be used for? On the principle that every simulation is done to support a decision that either has been made or will be made. So is that simulation good enough for that decision? Yeah, yeah. So, yeah. And, and that yeah. becomes, today, that's not, as big an issue because it's the expert analysts running things and they'll tend to make it overly good enough because they're very conservative people. Mm -hmm. But when we democratize it, now all of a sudden this becomes critical. 
Yeah, yeah. Because we can't rely on Bill just overkilling it. By the way, we can't afford Bill to overkill it anymore. Yeah, yeah. So then the, ne the next one is generative design. Because generative design will enable simulation-driven design so that the function that you want is actually going to decide the design rather than the geometry. So one particular interesting story I like to tell is generative design opens up an opportunity where I come up with a new design, a new widget. And initially, I have a very small volume. So I'm going to build this with additive manufacturing. I start to sell more and more of these Actually, additive manufacturing is not the most cost-effective manufacturing method anymore. It might be an extrusion method. I sell more and more. Actually, I might want to do casting because I have a higher setup cost, my lower mm -hmm. cost per part. So now I'm, cast I'm doing casting because I'm selling millions of these widgets. Someone who bought the original widget orders a replacement widget. He gets one. Its function will be exactly the same. It will fit in exactly the same, same shape. It will connect the same way. It won't look at all like the original part. It will be a totally different geometry. And that's because it's constantly been iterated on? It's because it's been re-optimized to account for the, the manufacturing process. Yeah, yeah. Which means it has different constraints. Its change of, of shape is, is, is limited in different ways, but it also opens up other opportunities. Oh, sure, sure. So yeah. this thing that was all stringy and had threads going effectively, that's probably not a good shape if I'm doing yeah. casting. And so uh, it'll be more consistent and solid. Yeah, yeah. And okay. so, that it's, um, so that the parts will change, but the function won't. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Interesting. These, these pillars are... Mm -hmm really well thought out it shows the 40 years of, of expertise so cool um, another summary of the pillars okay so the summary of the pillars would be the alignment pillar and then we have to have the business challenges we have the credibility yes, we have yes. the democratization issue yes, yes. we have the generative design issue we have the integration from systems level all the way down the detailed subsystems level and then we have the uh, engineering simulation digital twins. And I've heard this term now, but I haven't learned it yet. Engineering simulation digital twins. Right. Please teach. Okay, so there's been a lot of buzz about digital twins. And, and there, the first thing we need to say is there's no such thing as a digital twin. There are multiple digital twins. And I won't get into a definition of a digital twin even what digital twins are, because of the fact that they're very case specific, there's very different types of digital twins for different purposes. So what we did at Assess is we said, okay, if we focus on just those digital twins that are used for engineering simulation, in other words, capture the physics performance and have the qualities of, an, of a digital twin, so these are digital twins which specifically do their computer physical physics representations that tie to a physical twin and actually communicate information back and forth to that physical twin, but their sole purpose is about the performance evaluation. That is an engineering simulation digital twin. There's other kinds of digital twins, but we said we're gonna focus on making a clear, clean definition of what that is so people can get understand the characteristics, they can understand how to implement it, they can understand what it means, and it's not vague anymore. Okay, is this, is this a correct paraphrasing that there's uh, engineering simulation that is running concurrently with an actual physical part in the in the world and it's constantly having a, a closed loop feedback with that part iterating on that part making it better it doesn't have to be running concurrently okay. it can be running on different time sinks and it's not a constant feedback but there is a feedback so there is information coming from the sensors on the physical device yeah, yeah. that may actually go to a systems level engineering digital twin to say, actually, I need to run these four analysis. Okay. Those may be run and they will give information back what they think it should be compared to the sensors and back and forth. Some of this will be as tightly coupled as you mentioned as a complete feedback immediate. Some will be totally different time scales where the simulation might be run once every six months or once every three months or once an anomaly shows up in this in the sensory data 
so that it, it, it's going to vary on every case. Yeah, yeah. Whoa. So, okay, this is one aspect of likely many aspects of future technology that is entering into the, uh, the, yes. en the engineering software space. Okay, that was a really, really strong um, conversation around what, ha what, what is happening. Did we, did we miss something that you think is very critical to also mention? No, I think we've covered the main thing. The only comment I'll make is the Assess Initiative came about because I had this eclectic background from various different things, which led me to start the, yeah. which led me to start in Trendsim to fill the gap, which showed that there was an opportunity in the for the market to do that even in Trendsim couldn't fill, but it took a collaboration. So each revelation led to another revelation and it was this combination of eclectic understanding broader perspective i would advise to anybody always find a way to broaden your perspective um and that then led to saying okay there is this opportunity where we can make a difference and we chose to go after it i am i am so so much in agreement with how um on a very eclectic multidisciplinary background can lead to where you're at right now. And that is such a crucial, uh, just, it's very, imp it's so important to pass along to younger generations is to, to be able to have a desire for eclectic backgrounds, multidisciplinary backgrounds, because it can do really powerful um, Things can be uh, can be done when you can connect dots in novel ways at the edge of fields, especially new sciences emerge. So for the the young kids, I would say if you don't know what you want to do, find the one that you dislike the most and try it. If you like it, great. If nothing else, it will expose you to the things that are next to it, and you try those, and you try those, and you, yeah, it's yeah, the yeah. experience. You're not going to sit back and say, I really want to be an aerospace engineer because you don't really know what an aerospace engineer does until you actually start doing aerospace engineering. So yes, okay, so if you're, you're passionate about aerospace engineering, go there, but actually pay attention to the other things that are next to it yeah. and learn and broaden. And if any aerospace engineer who can think like an artist is worth a lot more than an aerospace engineer who could only think math. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. And so this broadening of perspectives and including the, the artistic perspective, the psychological perspective, the philosophical perspective, these are key to advancing anywhere because if you can broaden your perspective, you broaden not only your knowledge, you, you broaden the, the ability to, to see where the answers are. And that is in many ways the future is being able to pair together uh, philosophers, artists with engineers and scientists uh, and the ones that can potentially uh, even drive some of the geopolitical oneness discourse that we, that we really Absolutely. need. Yeah, yeah, Joe, this has been so fascinating. Um, we are very grateful that we got to sit down with you and you, had to got, you got the chance to teach us about <laughs> so much cool things. Well, thank you for the time. Thank you. Thank you for coming on the show. Thank you. Such an honor. Such a pleasure. Thanks, everyone, for tuning in. We greatly appreciate it. We'd love to hear your thoughts in the comments below on the episode. Go and talk to more people about engineering simulations. Share it with your family. Share it with your friends. And share it with your coworkers. Let's get more people talking about this. Also, check out the links below to both Joe's work. Also, check out the links below to COFES, Congress on the Future of Engineering Software. And support the artists and entrepreneurs that you believe in. Go and support them in your community. Support them abroad like us as well. Our links are below. So give us a support. And go and build the future, everyone. Manifest your dreams into the world. We love you very much. Thank you for tuning in, and we will see you soon. Peace.